Our text for the morning, scripture reading, is found in Acts 13, verses 22 and 23. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. I know the Lord will be adding to the reading of his word. Pastor Well. I I need to make one clarification. I am not a pastor, I'm a preacher's kid. My my father was a minister for 40 years, a conference coordinator and evangelist, and was a pioneer in the Spanish work uh, in central Washington. Um, Last uh, summer, uh, sometime in June, I was able to actually take my father and my mother back to Argentina. They were... They had been here in this country for about 43 years, but retired in Argentina and at our Adventist college in Argentina. So I promise, even though I do speak in tongues, because my first language is Spanish, I promise to only speak in English. I wanted to say that I've uh, I've exchanged a few messages with uh, Gary Evans and uh, he, uh, I, we're, I'm so delighted that you will have a pastor here with you. Um, I'm an elder in Roseburg Seventh Day Adventist Church. I'm a third generation Adventist. Um, uh, and our the work and the the gospel came to my family uh, when my grandmother uh, was visited by a coal porter in Argentina. Now you you may say, well, how is your last name Collins? Well, I can tell you, my great-great-grandfather was from Boston, immigrated to Argentina, and we came back up a few generations later. And so thus, we are here. Before we start, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that we can be in your house today. And we ask for the Spirit of God to be among us as we meditate upon Jesus, our Savior. We ask, Father, that I may be a nail on the wall where a picture of Jesus can hang. And we ask that you will guide us and direct us unto all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He was between 4 feet 10 inches and about 5 feet 5 inches tall. He was handsome, with beautiful eyes. The Spirit of God rushed upon him when he was anointed king of Israel. He played the harp and the lyre. He was loved by people, and he was a man of war, prudent in speech of God's presence, and he was and God was with him. He was the grandson of of Ruth the Moabite. He is one of the most frequently mentioned names in the Old Testament. The second most mentioned human in the Bible. Second only to Christ. A man with the glaring flaws, yet a man after God's own heart. He was from Bethlehem, a man of glaring flaws, yet a man called after God's own heart. We read that God said of him that if we turn to Acts 13:22, Acts 13:22, it says He raised up David to be their king, whom he testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will 
An interesting word right there in that verse. Will do all my will. You see, the bloodline of David ruled for 400 years until Nebuchadnezzar broke the line of kings. Yet through Jesus Christ, who is called the son of David, his line will rule through eternity. For you see the son of David, who was Emmanuel, God with us, will soon burst through the clouds. He will soon come to take his children home. Beyond his flaws, David's faith defined who he was. For he wrote 73 psalms that express his lament, his darkest moments, his praise, his thanksgiving, and trust in God. In spite of the circumstances, I couldn't help but overhear all the, the prayer requests that we heard this morning. Some were praises, some were asking for healing. Despite whatever you're going through, God can be Emmanuel, God with you and with me. He was the imperfect man anointed by God to save, care about, and rule his people. From the line of David came Jesus Christ, sent by God, the only sinless human God sent to save, rule over humanity forever. When he was old, they would cover him. But he could not get warm. Yes, the mighty warrior who had marched into war and fought like a lion could not get warm. David's mind may have drifted back in time to times of thanksgiving, times of praise to God, his darkest hours and moments, his victories. Over his enemies, his failings. He may have remembered the thundering voice of Goliath. Ellen G. White says that Goliath stood 12 feet tall, who was challenging anyone to come to fight him. Goliath was challenging Israel, but he was taunting and defying the God of heaven in his own turf, Judah. The Spirit of God was on David, who trusted in God. And then we have David said, and then Goliath said, said and David spoke faith, and David rushed toward the giant. Let's read about it in 1 Samuel 17, 26 to 49. And it says the following, And David said, Who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And the Philistine said, remember it's he said, he said here. The Philistine said, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And then David said to the Philistine, Here is where faith speaks. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with the sword or the spear for the battle is the Lord's. 
Amen. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what you're facing today. If you're facing illness, remember one thing. The battle belongs to the Lord. If you're facing temptation, remember another thing. The battle belongs to the Lord. When the Philistine arose, he came and drew near to meet David. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand on his bag, took out a stone, and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And he fell on his face to the ground. David also remembered the 30 mighty men of his army. You see, one of them was so, such a mighty man that he took on 800 men with a spear. Another took a stand when everyone else retreated and God brought a great victory. He fought so hard that his sword got stuck to his hand. When David was thirsty and longed for water from Bethlehem, his hometown, three mighty men broke through the line of Philistine garrison, but David would not drink the water to honor their brave act. David the imperfect chosen of God was under the protection of the Almighty when King Saul threw a spear at David. It got stuck on the wall and David fled. When King Saul persecuted David, and he did this for many years out of jealousy, David tried to, and, and tried to kill David. All of them, one time, ended up in a cave together. You see, the mighty men of David encouraged David to strike down Saul, his enemy. But David had a sensitive heart for God. Don't you and I want a sensitive heart for God? David cut the corner of the king Saul's robe... But he felt guilty and said, The Lord forbid that I should raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. After this event, Saul t told David, You are more righteous than I am. David, like you and I, wanted God's will in his life. David asked for God's will and he listened and obeyed. 2 Samuel 2.1 talks about this. David was facing the, the old enemies, the Philistines. And he said to God, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. And David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. David celebrated God's presence in his life. David not only wanted God, God's presence, but he celebrated God's presence. When the ark of God came to Jerusalem, David celebrated before the Lord and was willing to be happy and considered foolish by others. And I mean his wife, Michael. To, he was willing to be considered foolish to have God's ark in Jerusalem and God's blessing. But there's one thing David knew very well. Suffering. David knew suffering firsthand in the lives of his children. There was the violence done against Tamar. The death of Amnon who had raped her and who was killed by Absalom. He also knew the rebellion and the exile of Absalom. Absalom told Israel, if I were judge, I would give you justice. Absalom stole the heart of Israel and Absalom formed division, fomented division, strife, rebellion against God's leaders. 
We should build up the body of Christ, the church, not divide the body of Christ through gossip, through character assassination, through contempt of others, through rebellion, through the rebellion. We should build up the body of Christ and not tear down. Absalom, in open rebellion, sent secret messages to Israel and said, Shout, Absalom is king in Hebron. The armed forces of Israel in this civil war against the army loyal to David were a ratio of 10 to 1 in favor of of the rebellion in favor of Absalom. David may have been between 60 and 70 years old when he fled Jerusalem to escape his own son. David was in perfect, the imperfect anointed of God who was loved by his people of Jerusalem and the bodyguard that he had. You see, he had 600 royal guards that were Philistines from Goth who spoke of their love and loyalty to David. Let's read about it in 2 Samuel 15, 21. As the Lord lives, this is the royal guard speaking to David. The 600 Philistines that guarded the, him with his life. As the Lord lives. And as my Lord the King lives. Wherever my Lord the King shall be. Whether for death or for life. There also will your servants be. David's royal guard. The remaining army and all the people of Jerusalem left Jerusalem, it says, weeping, barefooted, with their heads covered. Ah, rebellion and division in God's people sometimes runs deep. You see, memories are long. At David's lowest point, Shimei, from the clan of Saul, cursed David continually and threw rocks at him as he was fleeing for his life. Do we sometimes judge and throw rocks at others in the church or at God's leaders of the people? It says that Shimei shouted and the head of the mighty men, the head of the army, Abishai, Responded. Let's read this moment, this low moment in David's life. 2 Samuel 16, 7 and 9. And Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. When Abishai, the son of Zuri, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord? Let me go over there and take off his head. David turned the other cheek. David showed grace. Because as we read on in this story, verses 11 and 12, it says, David said to Abisha and to all David said to Abisha and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite leave him alone? Let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me, and that the Lord will repay me with good for this cursing day. David gathered the men for battle against his son who had rebelled and wanted to take the throne of Israel. But he asked one thing and one thing alone. For my sake, he said, have mercy 
and protect Absalom. Absalom was caught by his glorious hair. And Joab ended his life with three javelins. Absalom's army in rebellion was defeated. But in deep and bitter anguish of soul, David cried out for his son. As we read in 2 Samuel 18, 33. Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would have I died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son. You see, on Calvary's cross, God himself died for you and for me. And this is the reason why God the Father, I could imagine those that have rejected the grace of God in Christ. I could imagine God at the end of earth's history crying out for his children who have rejected the grace of God in Christ. One of the darkest times for David was when he did not go to war, walked on the roof of his palace, saw and took someone else's wife. After being evil and doing evil against God, David tried to hide his sin in plain sight by sending a letter of execution to his general Joab in the hand of a righteous man, Uriah. Uriah was killed in the battle. Now David thought, hey, everything's fine. I'm the king. Everything will be just fine. Nobody knows anything about anything except Joab. All of a sudden, there was a prophet in Israel who spoke truth to power. God sent Nathan with a story about a poor man and his only little lamb. The anger of David David was justified when he heard this story, how the rich man had taken that little lamb. The rich man, according to David, deserved to die. Only after he said that, Nathan looked at him and pointed at him and said, you are that man. Colin S. Smith says on the life of David, the Bible makes very clear how sin works. It builds a position in your life over time. And as you compromise with it, it stays. James 1.15 says, Then desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The article quotes W.G. Blakey. The more room you give to evil desire, the more powerful it will become in your life. The more room you give to evil desire, the more powerful it becomes in your life. It continues. When an evil desire has has scope for its exercise... Instead of being satisfied, it becomes more greedy and more lawless. This is the way sin works. It tells you, just give it a little space. Just a little space. Maybe a small, tiny little sin. But sin is greedy. It always wants more. So guard your heart. Because if you allow sin to capture your imagination, it will not be long before it masters your very soul. Let me say that again so that we don't forget it. 
So guard your heart, because if you allow sin to capture your imagination, it will not be long before it masters your very soul. But to be fair, there's a question that can be asked. From the verse that we read initially, how was David a man after God's own heart? How could David be called a man after God's own heart who will do all my will? Turn with me to 2 Samuel 7, 15, verse 15 and 16. 2 Samuel 7. Verse 15 and 16. Again, I'm still asking the question, how could David be a man after God's own heart? After we have looked into his life, looked into his story, it says the following, 2 Samuel 7, 15 to 16. And this is God speaking about David. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. How can that be? How could David and Bathsheba's first child be afflicted and die. And yet their second child, Solomon, be called loved of God, was to reign after David. Brothers and sisters, there's good news in this story. Because all of us, like David, have a story. The only answer to the question I just asked It is because of the grace and forgiveness we have in Jesus, our Savior. This is the only reason and the only way. There's no other answer. You see, David was a man that did not hide his sin. He he hid it for a little while, but he learned to confess it. Turn with me to Psalms. We spoke about the fact that he did write 76 psalms, I believe. Let's read a couple of these. Psalms 32. Here, the title in my Bible, it says, Blessed are the forgiven. Psalms 32, it says the following. Here's David speaking from his heart. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And now we, he recognizes in this first part of the psalm, That Jesus is the all-sufficient Savior for you and me. And then verses 3 and 4, he recognizes what's it like to hide your sin. Here, I believe, was talking about after the sin he committed of adultery and murder. Verses 3 and 4, it says, But when I kept silent... My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand, speaking of God's hand, was heavy upon me. Have you ever felt the heaviness of God's grace upon you? All he's doing is calling us to himself because he loves you and me. My strength, it says, was dried up by the heat of the summer. And then it says here in verse 5, and this is one of the things that David knew well. 
He knew how to confess and he knew how to ask for repentance. It says here in verse 5, For I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And it says here, verse 6, here's a verse that we can meditate upon. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayers to you at a time when you may be found. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus is in the most holy place right now. He's interceding for you and I. You see, when your name and my name comes up, he points to his hands. He points to those hands that were pierced for you and I. We praise God that he is an all-sufficient Savior. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayers to you, that you at the time when you may be found. And then verse 7. Once you find Jesus to be your all-sufficient Savior, it says that David finally recognized where his shelter was. You are my hiding place for me, You're, you preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Do you want to be delivered from sin in your life today? Come to Jesus. He is an all-sufficient Savior. There's another example of David and his repentance. Psalms 51 says the following. As a matter of fact, in my Bible, it says that David wrote this after Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. And this is a very famous psalm. It's a psalm of repentance. It's a psalm that I want to challenge each and every one of you, whether you have the sin of pride and self-righteousness, whether you have the sin, any kind of sin out there, I want to challenge you to come to God and meditate upon this verse, these few verses here. Psalms 51, David confessed his sin with Bathsheba, and he started by saying this. Verse 1, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to the abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Wash me through my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And verse 3, for I know in my transgression, my sin is ever before me. You see, you and I don't have to carry our sin. We may have the results of that sin, but God through Christ, can wash away our sins in the blood of the Lamb. God, through Christ, can clothe us in Christ's perfect life, his perfect righteousness. And it says here, in verse 7, it goes on, Purge me with up, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And then, his desire was to have a clean heart before God. Verses 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart of God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a willing spirit. And verse 14 talked about what he had done to Uriah. You see, he had put Uriah in the front of the battle so he could be killed. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing loud of your righteousness. You see, David realized his nothingness. And he realized... God is everything. And it says me, it says in verse 17, and I want to end uh, the study of this uh, psalm. 
Verse 17. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. How beautiful of a meditation that is, brothers and sisters. So, we look and we see the repentance. But I want to share something, a couple of verses, a couple of references from Ellen G. White as I end. From this dark story, David wrote the model of true repentance, Psalms 51, crying out for God's salvation. The inspired pen says the following, nothing is apparently more helpless, yet more invincible than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. That is so beautiful, I have to say it again. My apologies to everyone here. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet more invincible, than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. The next um, inspired thing that I want to share from the inspired pen, Ellen G. White, is blessed is the soul who can say, I am guilty before God, but Jesus is my advocate. I have transgressed his law. I cannot save myself, but I make the precious blood that was shed on Calvary all my plea. Let me say that once again. Blessed is the soul that can say, I am guilty before God. Brothers and sisters, regardless of our best efforts, which are filthy rags, we are all guilty before God. I am guilty before God, but Jesus is my advocate. When Satan comes to you and say, you will never make it to heaven. You will never be a follower of Jesus. Remember this. I am guilty before God. But Jesus is my advocate. I have transgressed his law. I cannot save myself, but I make the precious blood that was shed on Calvary all my plea. Ryan Nelson on 16 Facts About David says, David is the imperfect human anointed by God to save and rule his people. David line leads to Christ, who is called the son of David. Jesus Christ, the only sinless human and God in the flesh who came to save and rule humanity forever. I bet you when David wrote Psalms 51, he was in line with this wonderful quote that I can't help but say again as we close. I am guilty. I have transgressed your law. I cannot save myself, but Jesus is my advocate. I make the precious blood that was shed on Calvary my only plea. Will you and I make that precious blood of Christ all our plea? Let's bow our heads. We praise you, Father, there is an all-sufficient Savior. We praise you, Father, that there is a fountain filled with blood. And it was shed for you and I. We claim only the blood of Jesus is our only plea. May we grow in grace this week and spread the love that he shared with us with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.